Unfortunately, one day, all of us will die. And when we do, the people we leave behind will care for our bodies. Many of us will be buried in a cemetery, and on our headstones, it will read our names, our dates of birth, our dates of death. We'll probably be buried next to our family, our parents, spouses, children. And forever, our relationship to them will be memorialized. And death, then, in many ways, it's continuing the relationships that we built in life, almost a mirror composition of the household. And this is perhaps best illustrated by a local headstone in the shape of a house. And on its door is carved, gone home. In the ancient past, burial took many forms. And my research focuses on a specific tradition where people buried their dead underneath their house floors. Around 2000 BCE, Areas of the ancient Near East were urbanizing, populations were booming, so more houses were being built. And as these houses were being built, this is where we see the emergence of this residential burial custom. It's attested at many of the major urban centers of the region, including my focus, Tel Megiddo. Now, at Megiddo, this tradition lasts for hundreds of years and is used for pretty much everyone, old, young, male, female, elite, and common. But we don't have headstones or texts that can tell us who these people were to one another. So we assume that the dead comprise a family unit, but we don't know how that family was organized, what qualified one for membership, or why they would be buried beneath their house floor rather than in the city cemetery. So I ask, what can these deaths teach us about ancient kinship? I am answering this through two primary data sets. The first are bioarchaeological methods, which means looking at biological and cultural dimensions of past people. I'm trying to understand socioeconomic status, spatial relationships, and sex, age, and disease. The second data set, which is the one I'll be talking about today, is ancient DNA. I'm working with analysts to understand which biological relationships were present, as well as the continuity or co-occurrence of various mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome haplogroups, which reflect matrilineal and patrilineal descent, respectively. But why does it matter if we know this? How can the stories of people we never met, never knew, who lived in a completely different world from our own tell us anything about ourselves? In short, archaeology has the power to reveal the nuance, diversity, and variability of human behavior which in turn allows people in the present to feel connected to the past. So for archaeologists like myself, it's extremely important that our reconstructions are not only accurate, but are inclusive and transparent. It also means we need to fight against bias, and bias does exist. In my research contexts, many people use texts from other places and other time periods to reconstruct the ancient household as being patrimonial, meaning that at the top of the household, the one who wielded all the power and legitimacy was a male heir, and from generation to generation, this power would pass and orbit around the men. This was evident in my first ever grant proposal for this project. A reviewer told me, quote, children are associated with the paternal line and identity, not the mother's. But then, in the next paragraph, the reviewer asked, a number of follow-up questions that, depending on their answer, would negate the earlier statement. Is this a patriarchal or matriarchal society? What is the family structure? Well, ask and ye shall receive. From one Megiddo household, the DNA from around 35 individuals shows that there were a number of contemporary matrilineal and patrilineal lines, suggesting a complex pattern of cohabitation. Further, direct biological relationships were very few. We only have four, degree, four examples of first-degree relatives representing three sibling pairs and one parent-child. We then have an additional four second- or third-degree relationship representing possible cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents. So what does this mean? 
This means that biological patterning was not the primary underpinning of family structure. It means that kin could be formed through social means alone. And this is not information we're gathering from texts or from art. We're gathering it from the people themselves. So, this demonstrates to me that in the past, just as in the present, the dynamics of household life were nuanced and complex. That the boundaries around kinship were more fluid than we previously thought, and that for us, this would all be invisible if we were only looking in the wrong places. Thank you. <laughs>